Good morning, guys. I missed you yesterday, but I'm here today, and it is so good to see you. And we are still in 1 Samuel chapter 2, and we're going to wrap up finally. Hi, Jamie. Hope you had a good doctor's appointment yesterday. I've been praying for you. Um, we're going to wrap up 1 Samuel chapter uh, 2, verse 1 through 10 today. And we're just going to wrap it up with the big idea that we've been talking about here. How Hannah's prayer is so prophetic. And how it talks about how God is in control, but maybe not in the way we traditionally think of him being in control. Remember, it talks about how he'll judge. Hi, Donald. It talks about... Uh, uh, the Basically, we talked about the scales of justice. How in old times during Hebrew times a scale would be used with a known weight and they put a known weight on it and then when they put things on it they would put whatever on there to equalize the weight so the known weight equalized and we talked about how Jesus equalizes us he's the known way he's what brings correctness right he's the one that came from god the father to bring the ministry of reconciliation to us he himself is the ministry of reconciliation right uh and, and let me say this real quick guys and i haven't said this in a long time whatever i teach you take it back to the holy spirit work through it with him that you might develop your own understanding in and through what holy spirit is teaching you that you will be led into all truth that you want to be led astray by any word i say or any word any other man said but you would subject everything to the truth of god in and through you to others and and that's what i try to do so i try to only speak what my father says hi donald how you doing uh but you need to take your uh, understanding of what i'm saying back to the living word himself so that he can correct and teach and build you into uh, up into his temple that you would be uh, founded on the cornerstone Jesus Christ himself all right so we'll put that out of the way right now so we're coming to this place of understanding how prophetic this word is we're talking about how God is in control of everything he makes the the rich poor the poor rich he kills and brings to life uh, we talked about the right perspective of all that and I want you to uh, understand this in the light of revelation and the reason I'm going there is a lot of times to get my uh, Hebrew perspective of what's going on, I listen to or more read uh, this uh, teaching called Torah class. It's great, man. It's a great teaching. So if you ever uh, want to get some insight, I challenge you to go there. I'm not making a commercial for it because the truth is I don't agree with about 50% of what the guy teaches, but he has this amazing insight into Hebrew understanding. And when you read that, uh, it will spark you if you're listening to the Holy Spirit to see the Old Testament in the light of the resurrection. And he makes this comparison between Revelation and the prayer of Hannah. And I think he's spot on in making the comparison. And so here's what he starts to talk about. Well, let's read this first. Let's read the end of 1 Samuel. Uh, let's read from verse 10 on. And the adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. From heaven he will thunder against them. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. This is prophetic. This is pointing to the Messiah. This is pointing to Jesus Christ himself. Yes, it is. And so we need to understand here that as she's praying this prayer, she's about to, 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 she's introducing Samuel to the temple. She's eaten from the peace offering, right? And she's in the temple where the priestly system is dead. We're going to understand here soon uh, that uh, Eli's sons uh, were, were, had turned against God and Eli himself had turned against God. They were using godly symbols to walk out an earthly institution. They were using godly symbols for respect and power, but they were walking out the will of man, not the will of God. Uh, what had happened is that they had placed God back in a box. Guys, hey Josh, how you doing? Anytime we turn the truth of our relationship with God into a doctrine, into a dead theology, what we've done is we've put Christ in a box. We've put him in a coffin. We've put him back in the grave. So weird because Easter's coming right around the corner right this weekend 
Don't put Jesus back in the tomb, guys. Don't roll the stone, the hard stone over your heart. Let it stay open that you might have a heart of flesh, that you might have a relationship with God, an intimate relationship, not a dogmatic, traditional understanding, because that will box God up and you will be dead inside instead of alive inside. You'll be walking in a dead man instead of a live man. So let's go and see why we have this comparison to Revelation. Why? Because in Revelation, uh, John is writing to the churches and and John is talking about what well, we see in chapter one, that he, first the son of man comes, right? That's Jesus Christ. It's so awesome. That's what happened in our life. The son of man comes. But these churches, at least six of them, uh, the son of man, Jesus Christ, has something against. Well, why does he have something against them? Well, because they've turned from a faithfulness to the word, who is Jesus, to a carnal understanding, hi, Yasser, to a carnal understanding of God. And I'm not going to name the churches, first of all, because I'm going to stumble on their names, but there's seven <laughs> churches. But I'm going to talk to you about what each and every church Jesus or God had against them. Now, remember that Jesus is the way. Jesus is the weight that equals everything out, that makes justice, right, on the scales, right? So what's the problem here? Why is the scale like this? Why is it not equaling up? Well, the first church, Ephesus, I won't mention all names, but Ephesus lost his first love. Some of us do that. We get concerned about things of this world and we lose our first love, right? Uh, in the second church, there's backbiting and fighting between people that claim to be believers and people that don't. Hmm, do we have that issue in the church today? Remember, the church is the body of Christ. Hmm, in the, in the third church, they've forgotten their root and they begin to follow a worldly system. They forgot that they're part of a kingdom come, that the kingdom is nigh, that they're not of the old kingdom. Hmm, does that happen in our churches and in our minds today? Uh, in the fourth church, pride has led them to be double-minded. They act one way on Sunday or on the Sabbath, on Saturday, right? And they act another way during the week. Hmm, and so they're not in a continuous relationship with God. Does that happen to us today? What? In the next church, they're, 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 they're very blessed, but they're worshiping the blessing instead of the giver of gifts. Does that happen in our churches today? What is going on? And in the, in the last church, uh, they, they've become religious. They're just following traditions. What they're doing is dead and not alive. And in the church that he commends, which is Philadelphia, so there's six churches he has something against. Isn't that interesting? Six, one less than seven, one less than the whole. We know that seven is, is a godly number and it symbolizes whole. So in the whole church, even though Philadelphia is in the sixth position uh, when he talks about them, uh, he says that they've been faithful to the word. They've been faithful to my name. He's talking about Jesus, the son of man. So what's the key here? What equals everything out? Well, when we get our eyes off what Christ has done, because he says in here, hold fast to what you have. Hold fast to what you have. Not what I'm going to give you. Hold fast to what you have. And what do they have? They have the word. They have Jesus. That's what he says when he when he uh, accuses or points out, because he's not really an accuser. He actually says in Revelation that Satan is our accuser. But he when he points out uh, this, this, this uh, uh, erroneous mindset, he says, hold on the fast to what you have until I come. What you already have, hold on to it, hold on to it. So what is it? The easy solution to not having a carnal mindset, to not, uh, to not having a misunderstanding, to not walking in error is to hold on to Jesus, man. Hold on to Jesus. Hold on to what he's given you. Hold on to who he says you are. Don't get caught up in a system. Don't get caught up in worshiping man. Don't get caught up in worshiping, worshiping even blessing. Don't get caught up in, in systems and, and understandings that are worldly. Get caught up in Jesus, man. This is what he's saying. It's so amazing. Hold fast to what he you have hold fast to what you've been given why because he is going to judge us this should keep us humble this shouldn't make us afraid this should keep us humble before god understanding that his love is an amazing gift to us you guys why do i say hold on to jesus because the bible teaches us in fact paul teaches us both in ephesians and uh what is it uh corinthians i believe 
Ephesians and Corinthians. I think it's Corinthians chapter 15. Let me look it up here real quick. Yeah, chapter 15 and it's verse, I think it's 28. And Ephesians chapter 1, 23. These are very similar verses. Let's read them here real quick. Let's actually read Ephesians first. Ephesians 1, 23. What does it say? Okay, so verse 23, he's talking about... Uh, He's talking about spiritual understanding and he's opening up his his uh, his his letter to the Ephesians. And this is actually the church where uh, in, in Revelation, it talks about how, how they're, the, they're the church that hasn't lost their first love. And what does he say? What does he say? Let's read verse uh, 21 or 20. Yeah, let's read verse 21 through 23. So let's see. Verse 21. It says... Doo -doo -doo -doo. Uh, actually, let's go back to 19 so it makes sense. And what is exceedingly greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. So he's talking about how he wants Timothy and the church in Ephesians to understand what God has for them, what to hold on to, right? We're talking about, and he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things in the church in the body which is his body the fullness of him who fills all in all so jesus christ is what we need to hang on to that we would understand who jesus christ is for us not all these things around us not what we see that we would believe in what we don't see that we can see it hold on to the one who fills all and in all why should we hold on to the one who uh, fills all and is in all. Well, let's look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I believe it is verse, let's see here. Uh, let's read from verse 24. All right, this is going to sound very similar. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death, for he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all all things under him and God may be all and in all. So how does this work? So, so uh, Paul is saying, Hey man, God has defeated, Jesus has defeated everything. Uh, he is over everything. Uh, he, he is the one that fills all and is in all. And the last thing that will be defeated is death. So even though it's defeated uh, uh, retroactively by his own death and resurrection, it has to be defeated in our reality, right? We have to pass from death to life here and death to life here. And, and this thing has to die physically, right? And when that happens, when he returns, when he says, I'm done, the, the, the kingdom's come and it's established and now we're going to walk it out because the sons of God have walked it out. Now he puts everything back into the father himself, us in Christ, Christ in the father, right? So a lot of times we get this confused. So this is what Han is talking about, anointing that, that he will bless his king and his anointed one in us and through us to others, that he returns in us and through us to others. And he also returns in a new reality that we get to walk in both now and in the future. And how do I know this is true? Well, let me challenge you to read John 17, right? So Paul uses this in all, uh, what does it say? That, that he would be, uh, that God may be in all uh, and through all uh, in 1 Corinthians and Ephesians chapter 1, 23. Let me turn back to Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verse 23 again. The fullness of him who fills all and in all why? Because it's all about Jesus. And this is what Revelation is talking about. You got your eyes off Jesus. You got your understanding off Jesus. And it's Jesus in us and Jesus in the Father. So us in Christ and Christ in the Father. And again, how do I know that? I'm going to challenge you to read John chapter 17, guys. John chapter 17. So the bottom line is don't forget your seed, man. We've been talking about this since Genesis. Jesus is a seed. He talks about in Revelation how the rewards as well. Uh, I talked about the, the, the issues, but he talks about the ro rewards of those who overcome, who understand that Jesus is a seed in them and they got to keep their eye on 
the seed. They got to water the seed. They got to allow the sun to shine on the seed that they might eat from the tree of life, that you can eat its fruit and that you can give its fruit to others. So this is the amazing prophetic prayer of Hannah. She is definitely pointing us to the Messiah just as Revelation is pointing us to his return. He's returned in our hearts. He can return in our reality right now. And one day as we walk out the kingdom, we will walk literally in our lives and literally in our reality from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. You no longer are a part of the kingdom of darkness. You get to walk out the kingdom of light right now as sons of God that all might not be a part of the kingdom of darkness, that all might walk in the goodness of God. So keep your eyes on Christ. Hold on, as Revelation says, to what you have. Realize that you already have it so that you can walk in it. Because if you don't, you're going to walk like a dead man. I think that's what he says to the church of of Laodicea, that they think they're alive, but they're dead. Why? Are they really dead? Like, do they really not have Christ? Well, no, they have Christ. They, 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 They know Christ, at least some of them do, but they're walking out as if they are dead. So don't let that trick you in your mind. You think, oh, this is so difficult. When you're pointing out those things, I can think of my church and another church. Dude, it's not about that. It's easy. It's easy. It just really scares your flesh because your flesh is in control. It's so easy. Rest in what you have. Hold on to what you have. Hold on to what Christ has done because Christ is in you and he's placed himself in God the Father. So that makes the three, well, actually the four because the Holy Spirit's in you too and God the Father's in you too if you actually read your word. But anyway, let's think of it as us in Christ, Christ in us and Christ placing the Holy Spirit in us and all of us in the Father and we're all one, one. Not because we're equal with the Father, not because we're equal with Jesus, but they have humbly allowed us to eat. What? What did Hannah eat of before she made this prayer? The peace offering, Jesus Christ himself. And the two have become one, and the three have become one, and the four have become one, and the thousands of believers around the world have become one with Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, the sacrifice of Christ in the plan of the Father. All right, I'm done. <laughs> So I hope you enjoyed it. It was a little long today. I know I was like, whoa, going around here. But I want you guys to understand God out of humility and awe of what he's done for you and not not be subject to fear because fear will cause you to box up God and make a doctrine to make yourself feel better instead of instead of allowing his goodness and a grace to keep you in communion with him that you might not forget who God the Father is, who the Son is, and what the Holy Spirit and who the Holy Spirit is for you and in you and to you and through you for others. (laughs) So keep your eyes on Jesus. That's all it is. Keep your eyes on what he's done for you. Remember what he's done for you and don't just remember it but walk in it today so you can remember and respect and honor what he does for you in you and through you today for others in Jesus name. So be it. So let me pray for you real quick. So Father I thank you so much that you are amazingly graceful that you are amazing, that you give us amazing grace, that you give us amazing mercy, that you literally embodied this in the law, that you came to us in loving kindness and just said that you interpreted the law perfectly. And I thank you that you expect us to steward what you've given us well, that you expect us to be, uh, to, to, to be, carriers of your goodness, that we would respect you, that we would be held accountable to you for your sacrifice and what you've done, that we would be good sons and good daughters, that we would steward everything that you give us well, that we'd freely give what we've freely received, that we would honor you, and that we would keep our eyes on your goodness. In Jesus' name, that each and every person suffering from depression today, from sickness today, from lies and misunderstanding and confusion today, that Holy Spirit, you would set their minds through through uh, an inner working, an inner healing back on the goodness of God through Christ and your power, Holy Spirit, to us, that we might see you correctly, that we might eat of the fruit of the Spirit, that we might be the fruit of the Spirit to others, that all might eat and all might partake in the tree of life in Jesus' name, that we might hold on to what we have in Jesus' name. So be it. I love you guys. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.